Welcome everyone to the uh, data engineering session. And um, we will also talk a bit about software development and things like that. So not um, our uh, core business at Correlate because we typically don't have um, the technical resources to do fancy um, but that's what, uh, why I'm also excited to have Ilya here because I've been following his journey with uh, Google um, Sheets, uh, data engineering with Google Sheets and the other Google technologies on Twitter. And I found it always very um, yeah, entertaining to, to, uh, to read about that. So I'm really ha happy that he's here to give us more insight on that. Yeah, so Ilya, please go ahead. Well. Thanks for having me and, and also for, for introducing me in this um, this way. I will start sharing my screen. Um, I should have put like a parental, uh, what is it, parental, parental ad advice. Like don't try this at home because all of this is experimental um, and there are reasons for that, but maybe this is helpful to you um, because it was cer certainly helpful to us or the team I'm working on. So let's get started. Um, I think you should be able to see my slides. So I'm gonna talk about, um, basically data engineering um, with Google Apps Script. And it it kind of like, so yesterday, um, Johannes gave this great, great quote during his keynote. And he said like, do what you can with what you have where you are, right? And this is like the core challenge, I think for most nonprofits is like uh, budget is limited. There is some constraints, there's some leg legacy technology, legacy use cases, and you need to figure out how to make it work. and in most cases also help how to help them scale, right? So uh, let me try to get rid of my taskbar. All right. So um, this is this is a sneak preview of what I'm going to talk about today. And actually like data engineering, like it's it's super important. It's, it's often neglected, um, but it's the core if you want to have clean data, right? And ideally it's super simple. Like understanding what you need to do is simple, right? You need some, some input module, some input components. You need some layer which collects the raw data, um, in situ data, something like a repository or a data flow or, you know, firehose, whatever. And then if you want to have like more robust data and more robust, you know, applications to work with this data, you, you probably want to have store your data in a database. And for that, you need something which is called ETL, extract, transform, load pipelines. Um, and this is where we are. Um, the idea for this talk or the, this thing, I started working on it uh, a year ago and I pitched it at the inaugural Coral Con last year. Um, with a five minutes talk or something like this. And um, back then I was still in, at this stage, just working on the input component or input module. So I'm really like kind of proud, but I'm also happy to, to share what I have learned during this one year journey now. Okay, so like the structure or the outline for today is, um, I want to introduce the problem obviously. So like the what and the why, um, then I want to briefly like outline or discuss how I approach this problem namely with Google Script and something that I call the spreadsheet factory, but our internal product name for this is like the data lab. Um, I will demo its potential or how it works and then like discuss, mention to you some cautious lessons learned. Okay, so like brief introduction, my name is Ilya. Um, I'm working as a tech lead at Ranking Digital Rights. Um, this is like a nonprofit um, research project hosted by New America, which is a big think tank in the US. Um, but this is only like a part-time position. And so the rest of my time I'm freelancing as something which I would describe as a product developer. So if you are interested in what I'm doing, you can like give a give my portfolio like a visit um but mostly i do like everything i'm like a, i'm trying to be like a one one person agency so i do web and software engineering um i started actually freelancing producing data visualizations and and maps um and now i have also like two management tracks one of them is like data management but like as a you know from a management perspective and information security also from a management perspective and all of this is driven or rooted by human-centered design um and just to show you that like I, I love this because like i think most of us here started with a social science degree but uh, i also started with the communication studies and political science degree and did, did my master's in political science with the focus on computational social science. 
Okay, so just like one last thing, this is like the biggest product I produce so far. Um, it's linked down there. Um, chemicalweapons.ggpi.net. Um, it's like a digital version of a research paper. Um, and give it give it a look if you're interested. And also there's like clean, tidy data set if you want to play around with spatial data um, of all chemical weapons incidents in Syria collected so far. So let's let's get back to the topic. What's the problem or what's the challenge? So I'm working for Ranking Digital Rights and their core activity or core product is the Ranking Digital Rights Index. And the index evaluates the policies and public commitments of internet and te telecommunication companies. They are only looking at the big ones, but like, so like the really, really big ones with the global impact, such as Apple, Alibaba, Facebook, um, also like telecommunication companies such as Telefonica, Meru, Etisalat, what have you, right? And this year they are producing the fifth index. So it's the fifth iteration of this index. And this year they are evaluating 26 companies in total. Um, but they are not only looking at the companies, they're also looking at their services like Apple or um, has iOS, iMessage, or Facebook has the messenger and the Facebook website, right? And this is of course rooted in the methodology and this methodology is very granular. So this is like at the core of the challenge um, with I'm dealing with. So last year they had 35 indicators with 140, 84 elements and elements are like survey items, right? So this should sound somewhat familiar to every social scientist here. And in 2020, this almost doubled. So we have 50 indicators this year and 335 single items. Um, it's a seven step research process. It actually has 21 sub steps. So it's very granular and tedish. And there is also a company feedback stage, which means that we sent out preliminary results to the companies and then they sent their results back to us. And then we need to incorporate this also into the index. Um, at, especially at the beginning, over 30 researchers are involved. So there's a lot, lots of users. If you consider what I'm working on as a product, there are like um, lots of also external users distributed all over the world. And the index cycle takes like around nine months. And out of these nine months, researchers spent about seven or eight months in spreadsheets. Okay, and just to give you an idea of the granularity, so what you see here is a single indicator from, I think it's from 2019 for Apple, and these are the elements, and this is the element results. This is the element result, the first element result for Apple um, iOS operating system. This is the according comment. This is sources referenced, like, you know, policy documents. Um, this is element level points, this is level scores, and this is the indicator score. So that's the thing with spreadsheets, right? They allow you to do this mess. So they allow you to, to intertwine or mix different levels of data, of analysis, of aggregation. And if you look at those two empty rows here, it should actually be only one empty row. It also allows you to do layouting. And you know, everyone who has ever worked with Excel, you know the pain, right? So this is what we're talking about. Um, the research process itself, just briefly, so it's seven steps and there are at least four components. One is DC data collection. So this is the input sheets, scoring sheets. This is where elements are evaluated and scored. And then there are um, summary score sheet, which aggregate single company scores. And then there are year on year sheets, which allow year on year comparison between two or three indexes. Um, and every white, white dot means it's a separate set of spreadsheets which needs to be produced. So we are talking here now about like, I don't know, I don't want to count. And then at the end, we also need to produce data, public data for the public website and then the report. And they, so far, they have been also sourced from two different um, sets of spreadsheets, right? But this is all spreadsheets, spreadsheets, spreadsheets. And if you consider the dimensions here, this year with 26 companies, that means that we have 26 input sheets, 26 scoring sheets, and the so-called aggregation sheets, like the year and year and summary scores, they are all connected to the input sheets and the output sheets by, by import ranges, but they are like connected on element level, right? So you can estimate uh, how many import range formulas this actually has. It's painful. This is the legacy infrastructure I mentioned. So 
this is the input sheets. I think this is the year on year sheets. This is the scoring sheets. This is also the scoring sheets. This is the summary score sheets, sheet, sheet, sheets. And all of them are connected by input ranges. Um, and then like as with spread sheets, you know, change one row, delete one reference by accident or not, and your whole spreadsheet collapses. And then you need to figure out where it broke and you need to fix it by hand. And this sucks. And this is also like an error prone environment. So um, I just briefly mentioned this, but like in terms of granularity, um, so I evaluated how, how like the interaction rate with the input sheets. So this one at top, this is like one of the bigger companies. Uh, researchers interacted almost 1,500 times with this sheet over the course of, I don't know, eight months. And it's been eight different users. And on the right, you see the tech team has been involved. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so this is a gaming headset and it goes on sleep on every 10 minutes or so and it shouldn't go, but like, thanks. So um, high interaction rate, many users and over a long period of time and very granular data. So it's, it's, a, it's a super cool actually UX challenge. So why would we want to automate this? First step, um, whatever I want to produce, this is like the big O notation. What is the effort needed? For 26 companies with 58 indicators and a bunch of extra sheets, and then consider like they access input sheets or output sheets or year on year sheets or summary score sheets, whatever I need to do, I need to, to do it this number of times. Um, and then with element level, this is like probably then the rows in the sheet, the same. And we are then talking about thousands of manual operations, either copy paste or edit or search and replace or whatever. So the main motivation is production. And I would like to have something which is like, you know, given a set of companies for each company produce an input sheet. And of course, for each company produce an output sheet or a feedback sheet or a summary score sheet or a year on year sheet. The second thing, um, spreadsheet data isn't clean and it needs lots of wrangling and cleaning up, you know, removing the empty rows, structuring the data, uh, wrangling, blah, 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 blah. Just consider this 2019, the final data set, which is public on the website. And this year it's a clean CSV because I cleaned it. It has a total of like almost 300,000 data points. Um, and we as data people, data scientists, this is what we want, right? Like load library, tidyverse, uh, import the data from a CSV or from a SQL database, and then do your regular wrangling, select filter group by summarize and visualize maybe, right? But it's not possible with, with plain spreadsheet data. So you need to put it in, in shape first. Um, and then the third thing, which is like the strategic perspective, this was like my goal, help the index scale. This is why we could double the, the methodology basically, or um, make it even more complex and granular. Try to automate what's redundant, what's labor intense, because this sucks and costs time, but also like try to reduce the error proneness. Increase data accessibility and internally means make the data e available more easier to the research team internally, because right now we have a bottleneck situation. If they need a new analysis sheet, data, whatever, they need to reach out to the tech team and also externally, which means make the data um, FOSS compliant or FAIR, FAIR compliant, right? Increase robustness and maintainability. And yeah, this is what I mentioned right now, increase research autonomies. Um, so this is like the strategic organizational goal, but then the index dimensions and the year on year, year, on year compatibility are a challenge since, you know, like if you double the number of indicators, you need to figure out how to make them compatible um, and probably also how to make them compatible if you want to automate the comparison, right? Versus spreadsheets versus usability. Okay, how did we approach this? Um, first of all, this is like the management perspective on this is uh, I did a research infrastructure self-evaluation. From this, we kind of concluded a data management transformation plan. Um, and then we started acting up, following up. Um, I met with my with the research team for a face-to-face -face, like workshop, something like a product vision workshop. And here on the left in the background, you see we did something which is called a user journey, but I would call it research journey here. So we went through every single research step and identified like the, the pain points, the touch points, and the opportunities for automation, optimization, how can something be, be made like, you know, more feasible or more enjoyable. 
and then we started developing. So let me start with the input sheets. This, what you hear, see here, this is for a single indicator for a single company with its three services in this case, step one, single indicator, step one. And here you see the sub steps and everything that you see here has been produced or added by code automatically in one, in one iteration. And what's not visible here, but all of this is like some UX, UI automation feature that I implemented. For instance, if we know that a particular element is not applicable to a particular type of company, it's hard-coded, it's pre-filled with NA. Um, if two steps are equal, then the results of the previous steps are imported into the next step and stuff like this. And also like rows and steps can be collapsed so that they don't clutter the view. Indicator guidance is at the top, blah, blah, blah. The main perk is that I figured out with a twist how to turn this layouted data or data view into something structured. And the secret is assign named ranges to every single cell. So what you see here is like element, I don't know, a single element result. And this is the named range for this thing. Um, this kind of saved my ass, pardon my French. Uh, the thing is that if you want to work with named ranges in, in R or whatever, uh, it does not scale. So you need to import every single named range. You need to identify the net reference and then import the, the value behind the reference. And so for this year, one company has 40,000 named ranges. So this is the amount of data one company um, produces. And this does not scale with R. It takes like, I think, one hour to import one company. And what I did to kind of take a shortcut here is, um, oh yeah, I will show it to you. But I introduced something like, like a data store, like a tidy data layer in between the input spreadsheets and whatever you need to do in R. I will demo it actually in a second. How did we approach this? I use Google Apps Script. What is Google Apps Script? Google Apps Script. Um, so what I didn't know like a year ago is that Google offers an API for every single ser service that Google offers, which means that they have an API for everything that you can do per hand in Google Sheets. You can do it with code. There is an API for Google Drive, delete files, rename files, move files, API for slides, for docs, Gmail, everything. And Google Apps Script, is JavaScript enhanced by some Google classes. Like, you know, there is a class for object sheet or there is a class for object, I don't know, row and methods like move row, append row, delete row, rename it row, set, set value to a cell. And Google Apps Script also is actually a development environment. So there is an, there is an online editor where um, you can run or you have to run all the code. Just mentioning here, there's another API, like an advanced one, which is version four. It uses a RESTful API call. So you can also use this and I will probably also switch to it at some point, but I've been using like the old API, which is covered by Google Apps Script. Um, and the coolest thing is that there is the class node package, which is a command line interface for Google Apps Script, which means that install this package, <laughs> you know, start VS Code and start developing locally with version control, GitHub, and everything else. Okay, so how does the spreadsheet API, for instance, work? So what I do here is I define a spreadsheet and I, I get the spreadsheet, like the very existing spreadsheet by file ID. You could also grab it by name or whatever. Um, and then from this spreadsheet, I want to have a sheet or tab with the name results. And that's it, that's how it works. So here I have the sheet results in this object. And then you can do whatever you want to do, right? You can append one row with results or you can iterate over an array of rows. Um, it all then like, so this is more or less trivial, but this is how it works. Um, and I guess, so this is my development environment. This is VS Code with, with the class package top left where I develop locally version control with GitHub you deploy to Google Apps Script. This is the online environment or online editor, um, and it produces spreadsheets. So let's take a look at how this works. Um, 
And before I continue, I will turn off my headset and turn it on again. And maybe someone can com confirm if you can still hear me. <laughs> I should be back and I could yes. hear free. free. Yes. Okay, all right. So then let's start demoing. Um, here I've been tinkering with the code. Just to give you an idea, this is what the JSON configuration for a single step looks like. So this is step six with the sub-step um, content. And this is how I define indicators. So this is a single indicator and this is the indicators elements, right? And then it's nice JSON objects or arrays and you can nicely iterate over them. And then all I need to do is like I write class push and then I deploy to Google Apps Script. This is what Google Apps Script looks like. So it's an online editor. Um, the way how I built this, so this is all the modules from input sheets, feedback sheets, whatever. And I have a main controller at the top. And whatever I need to do, I change the configuration in the editor. And then I select the main function. Let's say I want to produce an input sheet. Uh, and I just prepared this so that you can see how it's produced an action. And so, this is the CorelCon demo folder. This is the folder from the input sheets. I produced it already, but it, sh it should be empty. I hope so at least. Yeah, it's empty. Okay, and now we we'll start producing. So select, click play. And now you should see at the bottom that there are already tabs popping up. This one imports the previous year's results. Huh. Okay, of course, like the live, demo effect. This takes too slow. It takes too much time. Um, but it, it's doing something. I mean, I'm already very yeah. impressed. Yeah, so Google is really, really tricky. It's like, um, there's so much caching issues. Blah, blah. Oh, now, now we are there, okay. And yeah, right. And now you can witness in, in live how like a single sheet is produced. So we are now in step one, step two. Whoa. <laughs> so block by block, right? <laughs> And then this concludes with um, a lot of formatting, conditional formatting, mm -hmm. and a lot of other stuff like uh, produced. And okay, so we have the input sheets now. What about output sheets? So now, so that you can see it in action, this is Google Drive on the left side, right? For those who are not familiar. Okay, and now I, I will produce for this big, big company sheet uh, a scoring sheet. And actually, to save time, I will also start producing the data store. Okay, and here's the scoring sheet also being produced live. Okay, we have already step zero, step one. Um, I get the reference error because of course I need to connect it to the input sheet and they are, they are all connected by ID and those IDs are defined in the JSONs. So, you know, no more false references, blah, blah, blah. And is the data store already working? Because the, the data store is actually the recipe to, to everything. Yeah, okay. So allow me to introduce to you the data store. This will connect in a second. But what you see here, a single row is one observation, one element. Because I, you know, like everything is, is uh, standardized in, with JSON files. So I know what steps, indicators, and elements a company has. And then I can just um, write some not so complex JavaScript code to fetch the input sheet data from this shape and just import it into the data store in a tidy format and ta-da, tidy data. And then all I do afterwards is like I collect this with, with R. Um, Uh, with a bunch of like, you know, it, it can be like a single pipeline or a, I can turn it into a cron job or whatever, but it's a series of scripts. So like import, process, calculate scores, and then upload to a database, and then also produce some CSV files for whatever purposes. Um, this is what it looks like. So here it's, it has imported. Oh yeah, it's a nice example because um, you can parallelize the import with the future package, and then you can add some timeout API rates uh, error handling. So this one has imported like uh, 26 companies and I think, yeah, in 14, 1,400 seconds. So that's like what, half an hour or so. Um, 
And that's actually where I've arrived now. The data is in the database and I'm using Metabase. Metabase is something uh, like, you know, like your usual Microsoft, what is it, business intelligence or what's the application for Microsoft? So it's a dashboard which you can, or, or it's a business intelligence application which you can connect to a database. As, as soon as your data is in a database, you don't need like basically data scientists anymore because they can use this clickable editor. And this thing translates what you need to do into SQL commands. So here I access the 2019 indicator data and I tell it to summarize. So basically calculate the final score group by company. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's um, and you can create visualizations, but the main point of this is visualizations are one thing. This is the main thing. Um, Metabase is just an interface to the data. You can also return the data and you can export it. And that means that researchers now Mm -hmm. They are most of them are like legal scholars or social scientists. They can just download the CSV, import into a spreadsheet, and continue with their analysis nice. with, without referring to us. Okay, so yeah, a bunch of uh, lessons learned. I don't know if you have that. Like, I think my time is um, up. But basically, with this, I have approached Google Sheets limitations, like the hard limitations. I have caching issues. There is this five million cells limit, mm -hmm. and so yeah. But we can discuss this later on. Um, but it works, it's cool, and at some point we will probably open source it if we get funding. That would be really interesting, yeah. So maybe we have time for one or two questions. Uh, but later on, right? Yeah, probably later, yeah. We can uh, do that later. Uh, and otherwise, uh, of course, you can also find Ilya probably at somewhere here. You can also write him a direct message. But yeah, thank you. It was really entertaining. I wish I, wish I would have had popcorn for that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah.